Dave, you're inside of the Lysander. Can you go through the panel and, and maybe show us what's different about this compared to some of the other warbirds that are here in, in Mike Potter's uh, aircraft collection? Well, this Lysander is very different. Um, if we go through the panel starting on the top left, the, uh, this is an instrument which does not show up in American uh, aircraft at all because it's the brake pressure instrument. So this outside needle with the little round uh, part on it comes up and shows you the air pressure to the pneumatic brakes. And then these little needles, left or right, show you how much air pressure is going to the individual brakes left and right. And that's how you turn the airplane on the ground because none of these British airplanes have tailwheel steering. The, uh, the rudder is simply a rudder bar pivoted in the center. There are no tow brakes. And brake is activated by this lever here, bicycle kind of lever. And when you pull this, I haven't got any brake pressure to make it a noise, but anyway, when you pull this, you divert pressure out of the system down to the brake drums on those great big spatted wheels down there. And uh, that helps you uh, maneuver on the ground. So, uh, and so we've, that whole stick is, is slightly different than what we're used to seeing as either a straight stick or a, a yoke. Is there a reason why it has that round top or what was the advantage or disadvantage of, of that? Th this uh, type of stick grip is uh, stock in many British aircraft. Th they didn't go with a single pole like the Americans did. Um, it actually is really convenient for you to, uh, to, to grab. You can grab it this way and if you want to turn right really hard you can grab it this way and pull it across. You can actually get a lot of force on it and you can even put a twisting motion into it to help you maneuver it left or right. I kind of like it, but part of the reason that it's set up this way is for easy, easy um, location of the gun button and easy location of the brake selector. So it's different, but it only takes a few seconds to get used to it. And other than that, it's just a straight uh, you know, floor mounted stick like everything else. Uh, in this cockpit, there's some number of other things that are unusual. One of the is the compass down there. Uh, I don't know which model that is, but it's a, it's a P model compass, and um, it has a rotating bezel on the top, and underneath there is a flat uh, table that points to north, and you set your course up here, and then turn the airplane so it all lines up. However, we also <laughs> have one of these up here, which makes it easier. But going through the panel, uh, things are scattered around a bit, but doesn't take too long to figure out, you know, magnetos, that's pretty standard. Generator and battery switch, that's pretty normal. You got a volt meter, that, volt meter, that's modern. Oil pressure, well, the original oil pressure is over here, and that's stock for British instruments, but uh, we have a Bristol Mercury engine up there that is very rare, the only one flying in North America as far as I know, so we have a modern oil pressure gauge here so we can keep track of what's going on. There's the fuel selector over here, you know, going from off, oh, if you see if you can see that, you know, crank it from there over to on and back. Uh, this is a stock 1942 uh, Garmin GPS mount. <laughs> Um, airspeed indicator goes around twice, so uh, that's zero obviously and it goes around to 200 and carries around on the inner dial to higher speeds which this airplane could never reach but that's the way it's set up. Uh, standard sort of a six pack with a barrel DG. The British use a different system for manifold pressure uh, setting and monitoring and that's boost pressure. Again this is a stock British gauge, it's in many different uh, aircraft and um, pounds of boost is how that is set up. So this is a supercharged engine. So, you know, the, the boost pressure starts off with atmospheric, which is 30 inches, and then you can go for another pound of boost, two, et cetera. And uh, we generally take off with uh, less than full power because we don't need it in these airplanes. Generally take off with about uh, two and a half or three pounds of boost. The uh, RPM, You'd recognize that, but we don't have a constant speed unit on that propeller. Instead, it's a two position unit, air screw pitch, so it's either coarse or fine. Push in for fine for takeoff and pull out as soon as you get airborne to, to uh, bring it back to a coarse selection so you don't over rev the engine. 
Other than that, uh, the RPM just works like a like a light airplane. What else? Well, there's cylinder head temperature. That's standard. Fuel pressure. That's standard. The fuel tanks are not in the wings in this thing. They're in a tank behind me, and it's almost impossible to see the fuel gauge, which is, you know, my, my neck doesn't stretch around that far. So over here in the documents pouch, I have a, uh, a makeup mirror. <laughs> and I hold this, and I look over my shoulder at the fuel gauge, and uh, I have a fighting chance of figuring out how much gas I've got on board. Um, we have a Becker's transponder, and then we have an MC MGL radio here, which is uh, actually really good at cutting out ambient noise, and this thing has a lot of ambient noise. This is an interesting different system, and that's the priming arrangement. In this one, you prime both the carburetor, so you select carburetor on this gauge, and then unscrew the great big Kai gas primer, and uh, you start, if you look at the fuel pressure, start, you can see it bounce a little bit there. So you uh, prime the carburetor bowl, and then you select the actual engine, and uh, that squirts prime, you know, as you move this, squirts prime into the cylinders, or several of the cylinders of the Bristol Mercury. And for starting the engine, again, it's a little different. We don't have an impulse magneto. We have a boost coil. So to start the thing, the boost coil gives you a hot spark, and it's also a retarded spark, so you don't get kicked back. So you hit the, pull the, use your fingers like a musician, sort of, and you pull down the boost coil switch, select the starter, give it about uh, three or four blades up there, and then select the magnetos on. And uh, the mercury starts very well. Over here we've got mixture aft. That seems a bit different, doesn't it? For North American uh, uh, engines, it's completely backwards. The Hobson carburetor is way too complicated to go into here. But you select aft, which is normal for high power operations, and forward, which is weak when you're established in cruise. But the big gotcha on this airplane is down here, and that's this trim wheel. And uh, it takes about 15 seconds to wind it from uh, one end to the other, and you need the authority of the trim wheel. You notice when I move the trim wheel, the stick's moving. You need the authority of the trim, which is the horizontal stabilizer, the whole thing's pivoting, in order to gain the authority you need to either flare the airplane or apply full power. There are a lot of gotchas with this uh, Lysander. The other big thing is these, the slats. They're automatic and they're linked with the flaps and you have no control over them whatsoever. As the slats extend, they drive the flaps down. You can't lock them in, you can't lock them out, you can't select them. And so the nose of the airplane and the angle you put it at generates an angle of attack which either deploys or retracts these devices, and that takes a lot of getting used to. Well, at this point, we had to discontinue and go fly the Beaver on floats, which was a lot of fun, and there's a video about that on my YouTube channel. But to complete this look at the Lysander cockpit, let me just narrate a number of other slides. First, let's talk about the seat, and like most World War II aircraft, there's no cushion. It's just a tin bucket for a seat pack parachute. You can crank the seat a long way up, and when you do, the visibility is amazing for a World War II radial engine aircraft. And by the way, having no rocker covers sure makes cylinder head inspections easy. Here's what a stuck exhaust valve looks like. That's supposed to be about 15 thou, not half an inch. Next, let's look at all the glazing. The windscreen is just not quite wide enough. And that's part of the Lysander's streamlining. What that means for the pilot is that if you try to fly with the side windows all fully open, it's more like a hurricane in there than a Lysander. Too windy. Anyway, the side windows have a number of different position options, and you need that because the cockpit is hot. The firewall has no insulation, and the two oil coolers and all their piping are there in the cockpit with you. You do have a cockpit vent control, and it helps 
but you really do need all the cockpit side windows, their mechanisms to function. Okay, what else have we got that is significant to the pilot? This modification is absolutely necessary. It's an extra air pump, electrically powered, for the brakes air bottle. The original engine-driven pump just doesn't cut it in a Lysander. When you're taxiing and using the brakes to turn frequently, you go through a lot of air. The engine RPM, though, at that point is very low and the compressor isn't producing very much air. When operating from modern airports, you need the backup pump. Even when everything's working perfectly, a Lysander can be very difficult to taxi on pavement in a crosswind. This scene is from an air show I flew in 2021 where I had to make two tries to get down the taxiway. One other aspect of the Lysander, which I probably should have led with, was how do you get in the darn thing? It's a long way up. You sure don't want to fall off. I start off by putting my right foot in the toe hole that I've marked with the black tape. Grab the strut. Left foot onto that step. Swing up. Left hand to the engine cowl where there's a handhold. Right foot to the base of the wing strut and swing up again. Swap feet and put the left one in the next toe hold. Go up again. And oh, that's where I left the checklist. Next, push the slats out of the way to get a little more room. Adjust the harness straps before you sit on them. Arrange the parachute straps. Step onto the crossbar, take a grip on the windscreen frame, and swing into the seat. There, you made it. It's like climbing the mast on a square rig ship. All right, let's see what else is a little unusual about the Lysander. One thing that tends to surprise pilots from North America is the turn and slip indicator. The rate of turn indicator is on the bottom, and the yaw indicator is at the top. It's a lovely, fine instrument, but if you're used to a needle and ball, it's a little surprising. Another very unusual aspect of the Bristol Mercury engine is that the exhaust collector ring is the leading edge of the cowl. From the pilot's point of view, it's not such a great idea. As soon as the engine gets started, it gets hot, and then it heats the air coming into the cowl that goes across the cylinders, particularly the cylinder heads. So as you taxi the aircraft, uh, the cylinder head temperature gauge shows a continuous rise in temperature, and the gills, well, the cowl flaps, even fully open, can't quite deal with it. In some ways, it's like the Spitfire on the ground. You have to keep your loiter time, your taxi time, to an absolute minimum. In 1937, when you're taking off and landing in a big open grass field, this wouldn't have mattered. But in modern airports, where you're taxiing up and down skinny paved taxiways, it's a significant thing. However, once you get airborne, the temperature drops, no problem, and you find yourself closing the gills to keep the temperature at a good working level. Okay, what else is a bit different? Well, how you shut the engine off is quite British. There's no idle cutoff in the mixture as we talked about earlier. Instead, there's a knob called the slow running cutout. It's held in by spring pressure to the full flow position. When you're all finished with the engine and you want to shut it off, you pull that out Hold it until the prop stops turning, and then release it suddenly. Release it smartly so it snaps back into place and therefore reseats the valve. You don't want that valve hanging up halfway. Another very significant factor with operating a Bristol Mercury engine is carburetor heat. It's very susceptible to carb ice and quitting. The Bristol Mercury engine manual recommends carb heat hot, Anytime the outside air temperature is below 15 Celsius, which is very unusual. Well, that's pretty much it. The rest of the cockpit controls and indicators are fairly standard or intuitive. Flying the thing is not. And for more information about that, please see my other videos. But I hope you've enjoyed this exploration of the Lysander cockpit and appreciate, like I do, this 
rare and wonderful old beast. The very last Lysander flying over this land. The very last Lysander flying under my hands. We're headed west for 1,000 miles. Air show adventures await. One lonely Lysander left of all that were made. One lonely Lysander left. One lonely Lysander quest. One lonely Lysander pilot giving his best.